Yeah, let's, uh, I guess let's get started. So, yeah, players. All right, let's get started. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to OpenCV <laughs> Weekly Webinar. I'm Sacha Malik, the CEO of OpenCV.org. And today we have a very special guest who has been on the show a few times. Uh, I want to welcome Kat Scott, who is the developer advocate at Open Robotics. And today she's going to give us all the great things that happened at Roscon 2022. Uh, many different things so to talk about. But before that, let's... Uh, also welcome Phil Nelson, who is the director of content and creative at opencv.org. He puts this show together and if anything goes wrong, it's his fault. I always like to say that if you did not actually, if we, if you had actually uh, used your you know, title as director of content, just director of content, then we would have two docs on the show. Yeah, we could have been the two doctors. I just one more thing that I screwed up. Good morning, everybody. <laughs> Welcome to Open CV Weekly once again. I am your co-host with the co-most, the second banana who is second to none. I am also your plus one and only. It's Mr. Nelson, if you're nasty, but you you can call me Phil. And I'm here to remind you of a few things we do every single week here on Open CV Weekly. The first of which is a giveaway to you in the audience. Stay tuned for later in the episode where I'll be asking a trivia question based on our presentation. You'll get the chance to win the Open CV course of your choosing. You can see what courses are available by going to opencv.org slash courses or pick up another course just because, you know, they're cool and good. We're also doing Q&A with you in the audience. Please use the Zoom Q&A button at the bottom of the screen or the chat system wherever you're watching us, Zoom, Twitch, Twitter, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, to ask your question at any point during the webinar, and we will do our best to get to it in the flow of conversation. We'll also try to save some time at the end of the episode so we can uh, answer questions we didn't get to. That is about it. Back to you, Satya. Yeah, welcome, Kat. Uh, please introduce yourself, and then let's get started with all the good stuff that happened at, in Roscon. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I'm Catherine Scott. I'm actually now technically the developer advocate at Intrinsic because That's right. Intrinsic purchased uh, the basically commercial arm of Open Robotics, but effectively for most of us, our jobs don't change day to day. So definitely doing stuff for Ross and Gazebo and Open RMF on the regular. So nothing's really changed. I'll still be at Roscon. Uh, yeah. So we Roscon was roughly, what was it? It was October 23. Third, I want to say, of last year. So we were trying to do this earlier in the year, and just because a bunch of stuff going on, didn't quite make it. But it was in this was the first in-person Roscon uh, in three years, and it was it was kind of crazy because we decided to go for it and have it in Kyoto. Oh, uh, yeah, and we were very basically, cool. Well, in 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 Japan, things were you know they weren't really allowing that many foreign visitors during. Um, most of COVID and then it became like a very complicated visa process, which like gave, <laughs> to be honest, it was a very complicated visa pro pro uh, process. And it was like, oh my, uh, this is what everyone else goes through on a regular basis. I didn't realize it was that bad, but they, they opened it up for general travel about a week before Roscon. So it was really crazy to come in and see the whole country, right. You know, right as it was opening up. And with all that, I, we were, just, you know, when we were putting together the event, we were terrified, like, oh my God, are people going to be able to come or, you know, are, are we even going to have an event? And then they opened it up the week before and we all just piled in and it was nuts. It was awesome. I'm always curious uh, what, I mean, does the attendance actually increase if it is outside the United States? Because, you know, people uh, can convince their bosses or <laughs> to, to, you know, <laughs> fund the trip. But if it is happening in somewhere in US, they have always been to maybe they are not interested or actually it's it's more difficult to get more people outside the u.s um you know that's really hard you know i think in domestically like you know at least when i've been a graduate student worked other places it was like oh if you're doing something domestically yeah sure it's gonna be a cheap flight when you leave the country it's like oh well you better be presenting or have a really strong case for it on the flip right. side though you know just due to visas and stuff like that i think you know, it makes it easier for certain certain groups of people to travel and see you. So, you know, got it. Got it. Might be a I'm assuming that Roscon, most of the people are not students. They are from the industry. Is that incorrect or? Um, it's a really good mix. I don't know if we collected data this year, right. but it's it's like it's a little bit of everything, really. It's like students. It's like small startups, big companies, just individuals that are contractors. It's really a, a crazy mix okay 
Yeah, so this is sort of the overview shot. I, I don't even know if this is everyone because this is the last session of the day. You know, certain people I'm sure have already taken off and, and went out to explore Kyoto, but uh, we had just an absurd number of people and Roscon just grows and grows and grows every year. Um, you know, like I said, the COVID restrictions lifted the week before we got there. So we were worried that people weren't going to show up. Um, we actually sold out. Uh, we hit 100 wow. or 800 attendees, which, wow. which we were, we were, <laughs> we were worried if we'd even get half of that. And it was, you know, people really did turn out for it. I think people were excited by the location as well. Um, 38 countries, the, just the workshops alone, the first day we had, you know, almost 450 people at the workshops you know, 18 diversity scholars, um, diversity scholars come from, I want to say, <laughs> they're probably 18 of those 38 countries, because it was they're just from all over. That was a lot of fun to see. What is the uh, size of the team that puts together Roscon? Um, the size of the team, well, it's, you know, it's, it's broken out into sort of committees, right? So we have the executive committee that's sort of doing the main planning, we have uh, the uh, you know, the review committee, right, that's going through and looking at all the talks, looking at the talks, that's like, reviews, I want to say is fairly large, like, three, four dozen people, executive wow. committees, you know, like, eight, uh, we do, we do have an in event planning staff that we work with, their name is Meet Green, they're generally pretty awesome. And they've helped put together all of the Roscons that for at least the, as long as I've been here, three or four years, and they like, you know, I can't, they're just amazing. Like they, like when COVID hit and we had to pivot from like a, an actual conference to a virtual conference, they just like were on it and had some of the best recommendations. They're really wonderful people. Um, yeah. And so, you know, all these people are coming together, put stuff together. And that doesn't include, you know, the people that are putting in their time to, to put together workshops, to put together talks. Right. Um, right. It's a, it's a big group effort. So the, yeah. the, I, ordinarily wouldn't take like shots of the outside of the conference center but in Kyoto it was everyone was taking photos of it it was the the place where they um signed the climate accords it's just this crazy crazy building that looks like something it looks like Starfleet Academy quite frankly um and just beautiful beautiful grounds I had my my partner with me if you guys want something cool that is not Roscon my partner was with me he took a bunch of photos this is actually off a at one of the app or the Apple QuickTime the first digital camera ever offered yeah. by um Apple so he's actually been working on a, uh, there's this resurgence in like vintage digital cameras. So he actually put together an Instagram clone uh, basically for vintage digital cameras called 640 by 480. So if you want to see some of these shots, it's it's kind of interesting to look back at how, you know, how much digital photography has changed. Because I remember when I was really young in like high school, these things, you, you no know, one had them or like, there'd be like the school district would have one. Yeah, like a like a and, Mavica you know, with the with the floppy disk uh, thing. Like, mm -hmm. yeah, mm -hmm. I remember those. Yeah, and it's just interesting to, to like look at the image quality. But uh, that's a, a shot he took of the, the outside of the conference center. Really was just an absolutely gorgeous facility. Um, so first day of, of Roscon, we actually had the workshop. So we had three workshops. Um, I would say one was on open RMF. I think one was on ROS2 control. And um, a third one was on um, Mini Pupper. And then we had Roscon Japan. And Roscon Japan was, you know, we, we, I think this is probably the seventh or eighth year that we've had um, Roscon Japan and they you know co-located the event but you know the, the point of Roscon is to be a Japanese language event but we had real-time translators uh, at the event so you could walk in and go to this this um, conference that's all in Japanese and put on a little headset and listen in English it was it was really quite amazing so like I, I walked in at one point just to check on everything and there was a panel going on about like startups in Japan uh, that's Yuki, who's one of the new um, uh, Open Robotics board members, uh, but she she's the CEO of RT Corporation. It was really interesting. They're, RT is apparently doing all of the food service uh, robots for Japanese rail. I thought that was pretty interesting. She had 
some pretty interesting perspectives. That is interesting. The and the the rail culture is a little is much different there than like the U.S. For folks that aren't aware, like it's amazing. You can just hop on a train and basically go wherever you want, like one end of the country to the other, just on a whim. Uh, it's really neat. Oh yeah, you you could go. We everyone, or at least I, flew into Tokyo, which is a good, you know. I want to say two, 300 miles away and got to Kyoto. No problem. You just get on the train. You're there. Trains go on 400 kilometers an hour or something like that. Just, just amazing. And you don't even feel it. Um, okay. So I'm going to, I'm going to go through some of the Roscon talks, the things that I thought were cool and things I think are relevant. And, and I have to be perfectly honest here. I am paraphrasing other people's talks and I am not going to go do them justice at all. Uh, and so the, the best thing you can do, and I put, basically links to all the videos uh, and all the recordings of Roscon and you can just go watch them. They're short links so you can type them type them in right away. Um, so I just want to make sure it's clear that like, uh, you know, credit to the original authors here, amazing stuff. Uh, and I will, I'm paraphrasing as best I can. So just be aware, I might screw some, I will almost certainly screw some stuff up, but I'll give you the gist of what I saw. And so if you want to go see all these uh, videos, they're, they're up for free on roscon.ros.org. They're always have been free. So you can go look back at almost 10 years of Roscon and all of the talks are online for free. And that's just sort of a resource that we provide for the, the community. Okay, write, write this down really quick. It's really simple, roscon.ros.org. That's I'll where all the stuff is. I'll drop the link in the, in the chat for everybody. Yeah. Too, too lazy to uh, type themselves. I got you. Okay, cool. <laughs> Uh, yeah, so one talk. Uh, so this is an interesting one. This is actually something we've been working on in ROS one, and it's not. Um, this was sort of the talk summarizing everything, and what it was a, a discussion of basically a new ROS rep. So kind of like if you're familiar with like PEPs, which are Python improvement, improvement, extension extension proposals. So we have ROS extension proposals, which is basically, it's, you know, it's kind of like a standard. We have different rules about what it takes to get to a rep. So there's been this rep published for basically HRI, human robot interaction. And, and why I think this is relevant is that it covers a lot of, you know, a lot of the input used for HRI comes from computer vision. So there's stuff like, you know, all of these, you know, if you build a better person tracker, you end up with this question of, hey, I've got all of these joints in, in a human, right? And they're moving around. I want to track those joints and, and relay them in a standard way. And the, the reason you want to do this, right, is that you might have like, um, you know, human detector A, human detector B, human detector C, and you, you know, you want to see how well they perform. You all want the output of all those things to be similar. Um, and so basically what this rep does is it kind of iterates through all of the different um, representations of people that you're going to want. So like, um, you know, a representation of a human, like where are the frames for every part of a person? Like, how do we define, you know, this joint and this joint and this joint? And that's really important for representing a human in a space that the, the robot can follow. Um, so there, there was uh, human bodies, but there's a lot of other things like, you know, tracking in individuals and multiple people in a, in a video frame, um, recording conversations between people, gaze direction, all of those sort of things. If you're working in that space of like computer vision where you're tracking people and looking at people, this is really defining um, a, a set of like how to, how you want to structure the output data that's uh, as it comes out to get it into ROS in a way that's sort of uniform. And so this is a fairly new rep. I think we accepted it for draft, I want to say a few months ago. Uh, and this is all coming out of PAL Robotics, which uh, I think we saw somebody from Spain. This is a Spanish robotics company. Um, and they they basically have gone through and, and done all these things to make, you know, to build these standards that you can basically plug in one of these computer vision uh, algorithms, get the output, and then build other things on top of it. What else I got? So this was, this one was, uh, yeah, this was crazy. I think this was the, the keynote on day one. And it was a talk about, they're basically using ROS for like robotic liver surgery. Um, and this- Sounds like a lost Dead Kennedys album. <laughs> robotic liver <laughs> robotic surgery. Liver surgery. <laughs> yeah. 
Um, and so if I, if I recall, and, and again, go watch the talk, because I may kind of, you know, get this roughly correct. I'm paraphrasing here. But what they would do is they, you know, if you say have liver cancer, or liver problems, you go in, they, they do like a CAT scan or MRI and say there's a tumor sitting on your liver. And they do the CAT scan and they can like do the 3D reconstruction of the, of the liver or, you know, other organ. But generally, that reconstruction is um, it's it's a rigid model, right? You basically get it. You get the the three D reconstruction of, of the MRI as like a single shot, right? So you don't. And the liver is actually squishy. It moves around once you go in there and, and try to do surgery. So what they were really trying to do is is to take live video um, from a surgery, build. Uh, build a model of that live video and try to basically register it both rigidly and non-rigidly onto the onto the liver, right? So that you could say like, hey, we took this MRI, we're pretty sure, um, you know, here's the tumor area that you're going to want to remove. And here's that tumor area circumscribed on the actual tissue in real time and go display it for either, um, you know, for doing robotic surgery. Uh, so you kind of have a good, yeah, crazy. It, like the non-rigid reconstruction registration is just still, it's, you know, I may be not up on the literature anymore, but it is still a very, very difficult problem. And, you know, we, I don't think we really have the math quite yet to do it well. Like the assumption in computer vision always is that like the thing you're picking up is a, is a rigid body. And, uh, you know, most of robotics kind of lies on that. This, when you get into squishy stuff, it becomes a harder problem. And so this is just interesting because it's, it, it's, it's still researchy, but it's applied research and it's touching on all these sort of computer vision disciplines that are still, you know, deep research. But if we can crack that nut of say, rigid to non-rigid -regist registration, we can start doing some really, really cool stuff. <laughs> Fascinating. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, let's see. Uh, so this one's, this one's cool. I, I flowchart's not that interesting, but it's this atom calibration framework. And so what it is, is it, like, if you've ever worked on a robot that's got multiple computer vision cameras, right? They're all pointing in different direction. You have to, A, figure out the transforms between all the cameras, do the, um, get the camera extrinsic, get the, the camera intrinsic um, matrices. And, you know, that whole calibration process is, is kind of, it's messy, right? It's basically that, that, that surface where you're going from, hey, you know, all the math checks out, everything's easy to do to the real world. And that's where all the slop in a system kind of comes in. And so any robot that I've ever worked with required this sort of deep calibration problem. And it really, you know, we talk about the like 80-20 rule, which is like, it's, you know, 20% of the work will take 80% of your time. This is the 20% the of the work that'll take 80% of your time is getting um, good calibration. And so the this talk is just basically about framework for, doing all of this in a in a reasonable fashion and all the tooling that's needed to make that happen. And, um, you know, they actually have some charts here about like, uh, we went and uh, built these systems, calibrated them, and then, you know, came up with air metrics of how they performed and includes open CV stereo calibration, right? And they kind of go through and say like, Hey, on these different data sets uh, with these different calibration routines, these are the the general performance of these systems, and, and and this is big. You know, there's if if I've learned anything, sort of being an engineer for long enough now, it's it's these kind of to be honest, kind of boring ish problems, these really hard problems that people you know, kind of punt on all the time that really make the difference between a good product and a bad product, and having to do that kind of um, work to get there. And so this is just cool. Now there's this big open source package for doing, you know, camera calibration. I think there's also some LIDAR calibration in there. Um, so that's, that's going to save people a lot of time and just generally provide for better robotic systems. Uh, so this one's cool. Uh, my colleagues over at Picnic Robotics, um, they build Move It. So if you're not familiar with ROS that much, Move It is basically the the framework for doing um, inverse and forward kinematics on like multi-joint arms. Mm -hmm. And so they worked with this company called Optimax uh, to 
build arm systems for um, polishing super high-end optics. So the 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 tagline for Optimax apparently earlier the the thing that one of the people said in the talk is like if it has optics in space it properly was made by Optimax. So these are the people building the optics for satellites, right? We could guess that maybe some of the fancier uh, um, imaging satellites that have gone up that probably contain these optics. Um, and and what they did is they took the and they. Well, first, I think Picnic built a ROS interface to an ABB robot. They used ROS2 control. And they basically came up with this very, very slick, fancy control system for, for grinding down these optics and smoothing them out. So, you know, this is a tool pathing problem. So you have to get this, you know, multi-axis arm to go smoothly over this path along the optic that's all curved and and strange and clear, right? Difficult to to calibrate to or use computer vision on and get the arm to to go over these paths and really just grind everything down in a smooth, smooth way to get a very high surface finish for these optics. And they kind of just walk you through, you know, why they're doing this and what it looks like and how they actually got there. And so this is cool. this is cool. This is some of the highest end manufacturing you're going to find out there. Wow. Yeah, really, really like no margin for error on these things it's yeah it's, it's wild how precise they have to be yeah uh space stuff is is interesting because it's hard it's expensive so you can do some crazy crazy stuff um other thing that we have at roscon and if you're working on something you think is relevant you're going to be there but you don't have time to put together a full talk we have lightning talks and we're at the point where i think we put up an hour every day just for people to come in like <clears throat> one by one by one and do two minute lightning talks and so there I, there's too many of them to 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 talk about but i picked out a few and i think the thing to say like if you're going to watch one video and you just want a, a spread of all the cool stuff in ross just go watch these lightning talks sit down for 45 minutes and it's it's like watching tiktok right it's like two minutes two minutes two minutes two minutes <laughs> it's 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 like super duper nerdy tiktok it's just like next 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 um but you know we had talks from apex ai who are sort of building one of the first like safety certified vehicle autonomy systems and they were talking about their perception pipeline in ross 2 and how they got it to be you know so there's this problem when you're moving you know you have this you know, autonomous vehicle that's got, you know, I don't know, eight, 10 cameras on it, plus some LIDAR, plus a bunch of other things. You're moving a ton of data through these systems. And if you if you sit there in memory and copy all these images over and over again in your software, it's going to be too slow. You can't, you know, you have to basically take an image in. And then as you're writing your code to process it, what you want to do is basically pass a pointer around and only you know, allocate or move that data once or as few a times as possible. So they they had a, you know, a good lightning talk about doing zero copy and their perception pipeline. Uh, there was this other one uh, from the University of Turku where they just basically went and bought every LIDAR that works with Ross, right? And they they put them all in a rig and went and uh, put together a caliber, basically a, a comparison, uh, like a, a data set of all these different LIDAR. And this is definitely, you know, something, you know, it, again, it's one of these things that's like really boring, but really kind of important, right? So if you're a professional engineer, you're building a robot, you have like, you know, the proliferation of LiDAR companies in the past like five years has been nuts. There's like more, it, you know, it used to be like, well, there was Velodyne and maybe like a couple other tiny companies. And now there's like 10 different companies or probably more than that, at least a dozen different companies. They all have their own, you know, there's like the flash LiDAR people and the, the conventional LiDAR people. And also the application domain has expanded so much, right? It's not just one kind of LiDAR you want. You want it in very small form factor sometimes. Low power. Or like short short throw, long throw, like, yeah, power concerns, yeah. Yeah, and then just like you're looking at basically the, the spread of beams, the number of beams, the, the, the sampling frequency, some of the, there's parameters about like the reflectance and other things you can kind of tease out a lighter. But anyway, he took them and he put them, you know, basically went through and did this calibration, or not calibration, but benchmarking procedure for all of them and published that data. 
So like if you're a, an engineer sitting there and your boss is like, okay, we got to buy a lighter, which belt lighter should we buy? And you have to figure out which one, um, you can actually go look at this data. It's like consumer reports for LIDAR data. Uh, let's oh, see okay. other ones. Speaking of LIDAR, uh, Robotech, uh, which I think is a Polish uh, robotics company, uh, they basically uh, released a um, GPU acceleration for rendering LIDAR data because generally LIDAR produces a massive amount of, of data. So you like basically need a GPU to render it and they've uh, really some tooling for that. They, they then, might want to be on the lookout for a cease and desist from Funimation Corp. <laughs> what's what's well, Funimation Corp? Uh, Robotech is a famous anime space opera from the like the 70s. Yeah. Cool. Um, it's with an H though. It's with an H. That's what their logo is though. It's the same logo as the as the anime. <laughs> I, I, so. Maybe maybe it's related. Okay. And then the the last lightning talk. This was uh basically the the short of it is it was the weirdest thing it, i wish it wasn't a lightning talk because i really want to know more magnetic tentacles for robotic bronchoscopy i hopefully said that right all right i i got a video of that so my understanding you had me at magnetic tentacles yeah so my understanding from watching the video is that uh you know you're you're doing you like somebody has lung cancer or something and they want to remove these tiny tumors or do a biopsy and it's got to get you know your your lungs are basically this crazy fractal thing where you know there's lots of little turns and and uh you know movements in to get to the place that you want to be in the lung right if you're going to go through somebody's you know airway to get into their lung versus cutting into the side and they they have this like weird magnetic robot and they like thread it in through your airway Sorry, I might sneeze here. And then they use like a bunch of like magnets on robot arms to make the thing move. So it's like this passive robot <laughs> that they're threading in. Um, I, you know, I, I, I would imagine, I, I don't know if they're using ROS just to move the data around and get the control signals back or if they're using like say gazebo um, to, to do a simulation of what's going to happen. Uh, but this is just, crazy, futuristic, interesting, you know, this very early research stuff that just looks really, really interesting and cool. I wonder if they were inspired by uh, those kids that supposedly ate some buckyballs. Oh, wasn't they, didn't <laughs> they recall those? They did. You can't buy them anymore. Okay. Yeah, you can, you can buy magnets, so like, but they can't, like, they can't sell them as toys anymore. We're not allowed to call them fun. <laughs> <laughs> Magnets were my favorite, to one of my favorite toys as a kid. Like hands down, I just had this like thing full of magnets. It's just too much, too many good things. If you, if you know a child that's not going to swallow them, buy them a bunch of like nice magnets, but not too big. Okay, side yeah. story. My uncle gave me ma like neodymium magnets from like hard drives or like Navy hard drives uh, <laughs> that he found somewhere in the 90s. And these things were like snapped together, like crush your finger break, level. Break a finger. Yeah. Yeah. Don't do not do that either. Mm -hmm. So every I knew a guy had, that had an uh, MRI had magnet, actually. Talks? What? Sorry, go ahead. You had these lightning talks every day, uh, one hour and two minutes each? Yeah, like two minutes each and just like 30 people, 25 people, just like, nice. you'll see in one, I did one of them and I just have this list and it's like, we don't have a buzzer, but we should have a buzzer where it's like, you get two minutes. <laughs> Or like uh, one of those big hooks from the vaudeville days you can yank people off stage with. Yeah, exactly. Um, but, uh, you know, I think it's a good form. And the other thing is like, because normally you're like writing a talk for a conference and it just right. like sucks up all of your time and, you know, everything's got to be perfect. And it's, you know, it's not bad, but it, it takes a lot of time and the work's kind of got to be finished. And lightning talks, you can just like, we're in the middle of something, but here's what's going on. You know, if this interests you, you know, what's cool is that you're like, here's what we're working on. If this interests you, come talk to us and we can chat about it and, and just finding, you know, people that have similar interests. I think it's, it's a really powerful tool. Yeah. Um, like if you know what you're talking about, you can wing two minutes. Like, it, yeah, it makes sense. Yeah. It's, it's like TikTok. <laughs> um, yeah. And then there were a, a bunch of them about, um, you know, agricultural robotics is a huge growing field right now, and they're 
I think there was a couple, at least one, if not two sort of agriculture research groups at universities coming in and showing their, their latest work, which I, you know, is really interesting, high power sort of confusion, computer version stuff, right? Where you have these like indoor, I think this is peppers or tomatoes or strawberries or something. And you have to basically drive this robot down this, um, greenhouse and figure out where all the peppers are and then figure out like their orientation whether they're ripe if, you know if they're diseased and 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 then grab them um, it's, it's very big in fact one of our friends uh farm ng uh you know yeah. i was uh, talking they, to gary the other. oh uh, wait gary's working on something too right yeah yeah Ga gary's working gary bradsky who's the founder of open cv he's also working on this uh, with the, with a company called farm ng and they are doing uh, agricultural robotics. It's it's fascinating, and you know the the if you have used Orb features, uh, you know ever uh, in OpenCV, mm -hmm. uh, Ethan Rubley is the primary author is the first author of uh, Orb features, and uh, FarmNG is his company, right? He's the founder of the company. Uh, yeah, they're doing very good stuff. Yeah, there's a ton of it south of San Francisco and Monterey. Mm-hmm. Uh, so let's see, I kind of moved on to, to second day here. Uh, so this was a talk um, from researchers at Penn um, about basically GPS denied uh, drone navigation, you know, for basically perception, you you figure out where the robot is, its state estimation is like, say, it's, it's pitch yaw roll and position and all the things that are in front of you and whether you can navigate. Um, and, and the hardware that they basically use to, to get this done. And the, the, the videos and stuff out of this talk are, are absolutely amazing. Like, you know, I, I think at the end of the talk, he said that like they have drones navigating outdoors in a forest autonomously from point A to point B with zero GPS, just vision and going through these super duper complex environments. I think wow. this was the first day keynote. This one's definitely worth watching. A really, really impressive work. Man, so this, I know of another that, that drone would have totally just aced all of the uh, folks in Star Wars, you know. <laughs> the the planet like, Endor would have been a smoking crater with if this drone technology was available to the Empire. Yeah, they can they can do space travel, but they can't have an autonomous drone drive through trees. Crazy. So I, I know another company. I can't name them, uh, but uh, they uh, their drones can fly hundred miles without GPS. They fly higher, not not at this level, uh, you know, uh, and you can imagine the application. Is this, uh, <laughs> yeah. oh, and all this, I, I, the thing I forgot to mention, all this code is also open, so you can see how they're doing oh, wow. Yeah. Is, so is why this... are they call, calling it GPS denied? I mean, uh, the word, does the word denied mean uh, something specific or it is? My, my understanding from my days long ago as a defense contractor is a, you know, GPS was never quite meant to be a consumer technology, but they kind of gave, the military gave it away, mm. and kind of assumed that, A, if things were really going poorly, they'd turn it off. Right. B, like you can, there's a lot of people who, there's ways to spoof it and and mess with it. Yeah. Or, you know, God knows with all the stuff going on in space, if people were to say, take out a few GPS satellites. Right. Right. And there's also areas where it's not allowed, like you're just not allowed to engage it. So that's that's also a thing. Yeah. Interesting. So military stuff for sure. Yeah. Uh, but the the flip side, like the the other thing to think about with this is, there are other places where there are there isn't GPS, i.e., like the moon. <laughs> or Mars and stuff. So we need to, like, it, it is something that we would need to be solved before we do like, you know, space robotics, right? Yeah. Like, hopefully eventually we'll have robot, you know, tons of robots on other planets. We'll have to go do stuff and they won't have GPS and we'll still have to figure out how to get around. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, the first time I learned about, you know, how uh, these uh, people land uh, things on, uh, the, the vision system that lands uh, things on, let's say lunar surfaces, I was shocked uh, because they use very, I mean, I, I don't want to call it primitive, but, you know. Uh, Maybe rudimentary would be a better phrase. But tra traditional computer vision techniques and uh, things like that. Uh, and they also use uh, pictures from before. I was thinking that lunar surface that is exposed to the, you know, uh, to asteroids and whatnot. Uh, uh, and it doesn't have an atmosphere, so it must be actually uh, pretty changing, pretty um, 
pretty much, you know, changing Dynamic, a lot, a pretty, yeah. a pretty yeah. malleable surface. But that's yeah. actually not true. It's, uh, you know, you can take a picture from five years, 10 years back, and it uh, it still uh, is able to register and you are able to use a uh, very simple uh, image registration to land things on moon based on just uh, photos that were pretty old. Uh, yeah, like the, all the footsteps point. from the people that walked on the moon are still there. Oh, that's true. That's true. That's true. Okay, so here, I, I know I said if you watch one talk, like you should, you know, watch this one, but this, this was a 10 minute talk, it was, it was just perfect. It was called 2020 Robot Vision. And this is like, this is like kind of a pet peeve of mine, especially with like junior engineers come in and like, they're so used to, to like phone cameras, right? And like, on a phone camera like you can change a bunch of settings but no one ever does basically yeah auto focus and auto okay. white balance it's, and yeah but when you're doing like manufacturing tasks or like science tasks you're going to go buy a machine vision camera and these things aren't auto you have to go and set them so this was just um introduction to one of the um Ross packages for industrial cameras. And he just kind of goes step by step through all of the different parameters, things like, you know, gain, area of exposure, white balance, pixel formats, like all of the the, the things you have to care about when you buy, um, uh, you know, an expensive industrial camera and that you have to go figure out and set for your working environment. Well, the just... SDK is that there are SDKs which you have to pay for uh, like $500 a year for mm -hmm. one seat. Uh, just so you can use these machine vision cameras and get a picture in your software, right? So you have to actually pay uh, for this uh, these SDKs, which are five hundred dollars a year. Uh, just ridiculous, but there exists a market for that. Yeah, and so you, I mean, the the auto stuff is like different, but this just kind of walks you through. Like, if you don't know these things, you should go learn. Like, what is the game? Like, how do I set you know exposure? Like area of exposure, like white balancing, all those sort of things that people don't know when they're starting out that are really important to understand, like what what makes a good image and how you get to a good image. You know, part of this might be that we just don't teach like traditional photography anymore. Um, so this is uh, highly, highly, it's 10 minutes. Like, it's just a good refresher. It was just beautifully, perfectly executed. Uh, my my personal favorite, uh, was TurtleBot 4. So when we built the TurtleBot 4, we worked with um, ClearPath Robotics up in Canada. And they did a short talk about how, you know, how they actually got the TurtleBot together during the pandemic with a component shortage and all of the, the steps involved in, in testing it, putting it together, getting it certified for domestic market, all of the different steps that are required to basically build a TurtleBot and, and make a consumer robot. And it, ClearPath is you know, one of the, the best at, at making, you know, robots that you can just go out and buy and they work and, you know, tons of people use it. And so they have a ton of experience. And it's one of these talks where you just go and hear about the experience of somebody who's just one of the best at building robotics applications for like a mass market. Um, are there, uh, are there like competitions, et cetera, for high school students uh, that uses TurtleBot? There are high school, no, a lot of um, universities will buy, like, even when I was at university, right, a lot of universities will buy like six, eight, 10 of them for a class. Mm. And then every student gets one and you'll do something like, you know, going through a maze or, or some other challenge. Got and it. that's generally where we see, I mean, there, there are, but it's not for high school generally. It's usually more like early college. Let's see what else I got. Uh, oh, this one. So if you're interested in SLAM, uh, there was a talk uh, by Steve Masinski, who wrote the NAV2 library, um, just talking about all of the different planners uh, that you can use inside of NAV2. And so if you're, and how this relates to computer vision is that if you're interested in SLAM and the application of SLAM, this is a really good primer on just like, different planners that you can use once you have a, a, a map built of an area. And so this is just a, a really good tutorial on on how, you know, how these systems are put together and what components are in them and how you can you can use them. 
And so if you're if you're interested more in, in like, oh, I really want to do like computer vision for for slam and path planning and 3D, a little bit of 3D reconstruction, this is sort of a great introduction of the things that are built right on top of that, the sort of downstream applications that come from there. A uh, couple more real quick. Um, we've got we had a couple talks on um, basically food robotics from uh, in in Japan so another huge and growing sort of robotics domain are are these these food robots basically there's one uh what are they called mesley i think there's one here in san francisco right you go to the food cart place and it's basically it's not quite a food cart it's like a uh, shipping container and you press a button on one side and food comes out the other side um, so this was a, a group in Japan that's basically doing this for a couple different locations inside of Japan. And there's all these um, weird problems that you have to solve when you're you know, doing food robotics, right? Like by and large, like it's, you know, it's kind of understandable. It's like you take the ingredients, you do the thing to the ingredients, and then you put it on a plate. But like things like picking up soft items. Maybe Maybe or, they should collaborate yeah. with the liver people. Yeah, maybe. There you yeah, go. Exactly. Um, I, I and, want some tentacle prepared ramen. <laughs> yeah, and there's other there's other people doing other approaches here in the state. I'm trying to think of what the uh, there's a startup here that's I think working with like White Castle and a few other chains in America. And I think they mainly just do like the burger and fry automation. But this is a huge growing field right now of just robotics. There's a lot of computer vision going on, and this is just kind of a walkthrough of like all the steps involved and the problems you're solving and what that looks like. Um, yeah, I got a few more and it's just kind of like random cool stuff. Uh, so was well, not a talk, but you're just walking around Roscon and, uh, you run into people that are like building robots in, in central Europe. So this is a Leo Rover. This is a, you know, IPC rated Rover that you can pick up for, I think a couple grand. And it's just like, you're walking around, people have got their robots, uh, and you can talk about what's going on with their robots. Um, Oh, another little clear path announcement. They are uh, open sourcing all the hardware. The software has already been open source for a long time, but they're open sourcing all of the hardware for the PR2 robot, which was the wow. sort of, yeah. That's super cool. Yep. So I'm, I'm super excited about that. Um, yeah, especially come from the Open Source Hardware Association. So if you're if you're interested in how a robot like this is put together, that is all coming, I think, shortly. So that was a big announcement at the end of Roscon. Oh, so I moved. So the the thing is, we had Roscon, and then like two days later, there was IROS, which is the academic conference. So I, I tossed a couple of videos because I wasn't working. Well, I was working the ClearPath booth, but I it was there, so I got to. And I wasn't running around trying to make the conference happen, so I got some more time to kind of talk to people. There was um uh, a basically shelf stocking robot competition for 7-Eleven at IROS. So all these students were coming in with their with their various robots trying to like stock these uh, Japanese 7-Eleven shelves. It was, it was, that was quite interesting. I'd be remiss if I didn't show you guys a bunch of cool robots. Too. Is there a robot sensitive enough to properly pour a Slurpee? I, I you, gotta, you know, you got to get it all the way to the top. It's like, it's a real delicate operation. Well, you got to mix flavors too. You got to have at least two it flavors. It depends. It depends on what they got. Yeah. 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 You know, it's sometimes it's just like Coke and cherry and you're like, this is not. If that's all you got, that's all you got. You know, it's. Uh, I'm actually surprised how, uh, you know, uh, 7-Eleven has a computer vision group, right? They actually oh, built, fine. they actually built um, something like an Amazon Go. Uh, they have, At least they were trying. Uh, uh, I don't know what the state is right now. But it is surprising how many of these companies who we, we don't think about computer vision or robotics companies, they are very much into it, right? I mean, even Lowe's uh, has a very big computer vision, uh, automation, robotics group uh, for their uh, warehouse management. Oh, I'm sure. Yeah, I mean, you got you you will end up in any industry running across these these problems, and they're usually tough problems to solve. Um. Yeah, so this is this is a cool one. This is a, a product. I I want to say they're out of London, and it's uh, I think it's Shadow Robotics, but they have these these basically robotic fingers that have touch sense, and it, it runs all in ROS at like ten thousand hertz. So what you can see here is like um, 
basically that he, he's touching this thing over here on the left and you're seeing the the pressure vectors so you get both like the amount of force and the direction of the force on the on these fingers and they're That's they're working really cool. out like basically human hand that has what all these sensors yeah. i think there's wow. 17 on there so this is like you know, I'm sure these things are super expensive now, but you give it five years, they're going to get cheaper, they're going to get more accessible. And like a huge unsolved problem in robotics, which is how how to pick stuff up without breaking it, right? Like robot doesn't, unless it has a sensor, it doesn't really know if it picks something up. It can't feel, you know, your sense of touch. And that's how we operate. And so this is really, you know, as these things kind of evolve and, and become more available, it's really going to revolutionize robotics. What else do I got? Uh, so this one's cool. This is a, a U.S. company, um, and it's just called Hello Robot. And it's easy, you know, I, I, and I don't mean this disparagingly. It's like a, a two-step up turtle bot where it's a mobile base, um, camera, and in this, like, really cool little arm that's got a fairly decent payload capacity. And they just raised a few million dollars, I think, and they're finding you know, that these robots can be super helpful for people with disabilities, right? Or that are like mobility impaired, that you could put this in your house and like, hey, I need, you know, if you're, <clears throat> you know, if you can't really get up and move around, you can't like mm. go to the kitchen and get yourself a drink. You can't go and like pick up the mail on the other side of the house and bring it to you. So they're really looking into how they can use these for these sorts of tasks, right? These um, mobility or, you know, helping tasks for people with uh, mobility impairment. So I'm, mm. these are, these are super cool robots. Yeah. And, and like, I mean, you know, in our business, the, the type in business, um, a lot of folks when they, they get older, for example, can't grip at, like they used to it was just even simple things like that. I think these are, these are, you know, huge game changers in terms of quality of life just for everybody at some point. Yeah, totally. I mean, it's still research phase, but this is this is cool stuff, and it like this is built to not be insanely yeah. expensive. Uh, what else do I got? Uh, okay, so I think I got two more. This one, this one's not so. It's it's uh, similar to the hand idea. I think this is Honda Research, and this is similar uh, to the hand I showed you earlier, where it's got touch sensing and it's this complex robotic hand. But what's interesting is this one also has fingernails. And so they had this really slick demo using Ross of this of this hand basically figuring out and I'll fast forward it here real quickly, um, figuring out how to open a can automatically with this like robot fingernail and this touch sensitivity. You can see the the, the touch vectors over here. And we're gonna we're gonna look back on this as the time when we really lost the war with machines when we we made it so they could drink Red Bull. Yes, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> I drank that Red Bull. It was it hit the spot. It was a, it was a long day. I was actually surprised. Uh, you know, Honda uh, had one of the first few humanoid robots way back. Yeah, the bipedal the robots. Asimo? Yeah. yeah, Asimo. Yeah. So Asimo, and then uh, you know they kind of lost the lost their way uh, with that, right? They did not go the Boston Dynamics uh, way. They did not push the technology far enough. For it to be uh, like yeah it seems like it kind of ran out of steam after a while yeah. yeah yeah i i don't know you know research is expensive and if there's no business outcomes you know it's kind of like yeah. that tends to happen um let's see i got i got one more so this is for phil this is a. Uh, this was, I forget which group this is, but it was a mobile robot group. Oh my God. And it's playing an automaton. Oh my God. So I was working in the booth, like a couple of booths away the entire, and it was going the entire time. If you don't know what this is, this is an automaton. Wow. This is a, a, a crazy little Japanese instrument that it just makes the most cute, annoying sound you can ever imagine. Uh, and it's got a little mouth. And so basically you, you press the top and it makes different noises. And then you can kind of like shape notes with the mouth. Yeah, it's it's kind of between a like a saxophone and like a, like almost a marimba kind of thing because you're just manipulating with your fingers. Yeah. So yeah. really, that's that's incredible. I, I'm glad that that was not spoiled for me. Thank you for <laughs> thank you for the robot playing music. All right, and so let's see. We're getting we're getting close to time here. Uh, just a couple of things. If you want to go, a couple of events coming up. Open Hardware Summit, 
So I'm also on the board of the Open Hardware uh, Association. Uh, this is in New York City. So if you're on the East Coast, this is just a bunch of people doing stuff with the open hardware. There will be some cameras. It's a really, really, really great event. It's quite affordable to go as well. So if you want to join us there, that's going on. We got, uh, finally, Roscon this year will be October 18th and the 20th uh, in New Orleans. Finally, we've been trying to have a, an event in New Orleans for uh, three years. It's finally happening. Um, uh, there should be more information out in the next couple months about like, you know, how to submit your papers and like what ticket prices will look like and that sort of thing. But we should, you know, we're, we're having Roscon again this year and it's going to be in the U.S. Uh, I'm really worried about this one. I, I know that I'm going to come, I'm going to go and I'm going to come back with a very expensive guitar. Uh -oh. <laughs> well, it, it's almost as bad in Japan because Japanese guitars, man, amazing. Mm -hmm. um, there's also going to be a Roscon JP this year. So this is the old logo, but there's going to be one for 23. I don't know if they, I don't, the post is in Japanese. So I'm not quite sure on the location. I want to say this is in July or no, wait, I think this is in September. And then there's also going to be Roscon France in Bordeaux. And that's going to be like roughly the fourth and the fifth. Posts about both of these are on Ross Discourse. So if you're calling in from, you know, somewhere in Western Europe or in, you know, Asia Pacific, there's going to be a Roscon event near you. And it hopefully will be in a language you speak. Um, yeah. I mean, I got a bunch of filler stuff, but like that's the, the short of it if we have extra time. But I think you guys got some stuff to do too, right? That's cool. Yeah. Very cool. Is it was the Nerf uh, slam video there? Yeah. Dude, lots of, okay. man, Nerf is Nerf is really taken off. Uh, yeah, I pulled out some cool stuff, but then I go look at the source code and uh Jeff Powers is on the like <laughs> <commit> <laughs> list. I'm <laughs> like, he just changed, you know, he cleaned up a file or something like that. He didn't write it, but I was like, oh, I know this person. <laughs> That's funny. Yeah. <laughs> Good morning, Jeff, if you're watching. <laughs> If you're joining us for the first time, or if you just need a reminder, one of the things we do every single week here on OpenCV Weekly is a giveaway to you in the audience. You will be answering a trivia question based on the talk today with the opportunity to win the OpenCV course of your choosing. You can go to opencv.org slash courses to see what courses are available. The first person to answer the trivia question I asked correctly in the Zoom chat will win the course of their choosing. If you have won in the last couple of months, Please don't answer and give other people a chance to answer. So this episode was just all about Roscon 2022. Um, there were quite a lot of attendees from different countries. 800 attendees from how many different countries? How many different countries? Oh, Johnny Lee was oh, just right out of the box with so that fast. one. <laughs> Okie smokes bullwinkle. All right. Congratulations, Johnny. Send uh, one email to phil at opencv.org with the course you would like. The answer you were looking for was 38. That is 38 countries, 800 attendees from 38 countries. Congratulations, Johnny. Send an email and we'll get you your course. Um, gosh, yeah, I uh, we got some interesting questions from folks. First of all, people want to know, can we uh, share your slides with folks as part of the YouTube upload later, Kat? I think you're muted there. Sorry about that. I was uh, typing in the chat. Uh, yeah, totally. Yeah. And, and yeah. every, you know, the slides are there. There's just pictures, but like, just go to roscon.ros.org. It's all there. The, the the slides for the talks are there. The videos are mm -hmm. there. The summaries are there. So my slides are just a guide to what's what's actually from the event. So we had a question from YouTube. Somebody, this is one that I was interested to in know as well, is a little bit behind the scenes information on like how how early do folks start do you start planning for a Roscon event like how long does it take to put something this big together uh so well to give you an idea we have our first meeting next week for Roscon 2023 and it's in late October okay makes sense and, and, makes and sense. we we and I'll be honest like we reserved the the location a year ago or longer mm. So, it wow. seems like the, the longest lead thing is making sure the venue is locked down and, and stuff like that, right? Like, yeah. Yeah, cool. you got to do that a few months out or a few, yeah. like quite a few months out. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, speaking of events, uh, you'll have the chance to uh, meet me and probably also Satya at uh, Embedded Vision Summit this year. It's May 22nd, I believe. Come say hi. Well, OpenCV will have a booth there. We'll be 
cracking wise and, and talking computer vision. Um, so Tia, we got any announcements this week from your side? Announcements, let's uh, let's see, not really. I mean, we have already announced the uh, competition winners, et cetera, and mm -hmm. uh, people who have not checked out, uh, they should go and check out OpenCV AI competition winners. That uh, webinar uh, was very uh, helpful, you know, went over a few a uh, few winners. Yeah, really, really awesome videos from the winners. We'll be uploading all of those winners videos to our YouTube channel as well. So you can kind of go through the list and, and see all of the, the people who won honors this year. Um, we'll, you know, we're, we're working on the next uh, competition. If you want to be a part of that, you should go to opencv.org slash subscribe and sign up for the OpenCV newsletter. We'll let everybody know uh, there first when things happen, like contests, competitions, chances to win things, etc. cetera. Um, man, Mario just told me it's 10 o'clock, I guess. Uh, <laughs> Satya, you want to go ahead and take us home here? Yeah, thank you so much, uh, Kat. It was a pleasure. As always, you bring so much value to the webinar. And this one was fascinating. I've been, I've been thinking all through the webinar, you know, uh, how can we put together OpenCV <laughs> <laughs> conference someday? Uh, and yeah. this is really fascinating stuff. All the things that uh, happened at Roscon. Uh, really uh, thankful that you came on here and, uh, you know. Uh, yeah, better see you guys there this year because it's in the US. It's not that hard. All right, all right. Yeah, I'll be I'll be there for sure. I'll be I'll be in I'll be in New Orleans for for Roscon for sure. Wonderful. Yeah, and I also want to thank uh, Phil uh, for putting the show together, and thank you so much to all our audience. Uh, it's a pleasure to have you here week after week. I really appreciate your presence here. Thank you. Absolutely, we wouldn't do these shows if you didn't watch them. Join us again next week, same bat time, same bat channel, Thursday at 9 a.m., wherever you're watching. Thank you for joining us and have a great day wherever you may be. Thank you. Bye. Thanks so much for watching this episode of the webinar. Please hit that like button, subscribe, and don't forget to tap the little bell icon to be notified when new episodes drop. This week's episode was brought to you by OpenCV Courses. Learn computer vision and AI from the best at opencv.org slash courses. If you'd like to be in the audience next week, subscribe to the OpenCV newsletter.